This Thursday, April 11th, NBA Betting Picks edition of the NBA Gambling Podcast on the Sports Gambling Podcast Network is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Play their fantasy pick them for a chance to win 100x in NBA, MLB, NHL, golf, and more. Sign up today using our promo code NBASGPN to get a 100% deposit match. We're also brought to you by AVO. AVO gives you the opportunity to take advantage of premium arbitrage sports betting. Use your tool to bet both sides and lock in a profit. Access our platform for absolutely free at arbsversusodds.com. That's A-R-B-S-V-S-Odds.com. Welcome, everyone, to the NBA Gambling Podcast, part of the Sports Gambling Podcast Network. It is Thursday, April 11th, currently 11.06 on the East Coast. Here to recap what we saw in the association on Wednesday night and get into the five-game schedule in the NBA on Thursday night as we are winding down the NBA season, getting ready for the play-in tournament and obviously the NBA playoffs. But joining me here to help me break everything down on the hardwood Got my guy here with me. It's Scott Sudi Rochelle. Scott, what's going on, my man? How are you doing this Thursday morning? Yeah, doing pretty well. Uh, looking forward to the last week or so. So it should be a fun end to the regular season. A lot of teams still fighting for seeding, or I should say fighting for seeding. Some teams might be trying to tank theirs. Who knows? Uh, but the point is a lot of playoff matchups still undecided. I think we got our first official matchup, though, because the Clippers are taking on the Mavericks. We don't exactly know who the home team's going to be, I think. But that mm-hmm. is the matchup as far as I understand it. Is that correct? I think so. I think the assuming Clippers are going to be the home team, but still. Yeah, I think um, what I saw yesterday was that the Clippers needed one more win to clinch the fourth seed, if I'm not mistaken. Um, So they have two games left. Obviously, nobody played last night for the Clippers. Sorry for the yeah for the Clippers. Um, um, And then they have one game left against the let's see here, the Rockets, and then they have the Jazz left and they're all at home here for L.A. So. They're done traveling for the season, so two winnable games for sure there for the Clippers. It seems like if they win one of those two, they'll end up being the four seed, and then they will be hosting the Dallas Mavericks, like you mentioned. So we know at least four and five are pretty much cemented, like you mentioned. It's just uh, we're trying to figure out right now in the Western Conference who's going to be the sixth seed and the seventh seed, and we do know that the Lakers and the Warriors are locked into the playing tournament it'll just depend on if the lakers get into that eighth spot over sacramento and uh so on and so forth but i think you can pretty much guarantee that where's i think their ceiling is going to be that ninth uh spot uh in the western conference so so some things to be determined like we mentioned like with seating and things like that but like scott you mentioned yeah we have the clippers and the mavericks i think that's going to be a really fun series to watch for sure but we'll talk about that obviously next week uh, as we still have uh two to three games left per team in the nba regular season at least last night uh was uh pretty standard i think we can say a um, couple of blowouts as anticipated some almost outright dogs winning uh we did have charlotte uh i think they were with a 10 and a half point, 11 and a half point dog in that game against the Atlanta Hawks. After all the injury news came out, they went into Atlanta, got the outright victory. Trey and I had we, that. Once once yeah. we heard Trey was coming back, we're like, all right, sure, give us Charlotte, and they won the game. Yeah, and then what Jante got ruled out um, later in the day, but yeah, the line didn't really affect. I think he moved like maybe a point at that, but that was a great call there on the Hornets money line going into Atlanta. Cleveland was in trouble within the first eight minutes of the game against Memphis, but they ended up winning the first quarter. They were down at the half, but then they turned it on in the second half against the Memphis Grizzlies. I think this number closed around 18 and a half, if I'm not mistaken, but Memphis did cover the number. Cleveland gets the outright victory, 110 to 98. Toronto and Brooklyn, 106-102. Dallas, as anticipated, I think by a lot of us, I went into Miami, got the victory there. Okay, so I don't get the line business. movement in that and game. What, the, the, game? The, the line went from like three and a half to two, and I don't know mm-hmm. why people were betting on Miami because they were exhausted and they got killed. Like I, I, don't, I don't understand the line movement on that game. Double overtime, right, against Atlanta. Yeah. 
So yeah, I didn't get it either. Uh, I was on Dallas last night. In fact, I gave him out on YouTube. I, I just don't understand what the logic was for that, but yeah. not my problem, I guess. And then the game of the night, I think we could talk about this one uh, was the Denver Nuggets hosting the Minnesota Timberwolves. Denver was around a six, six point favorite in this game. Uh, they did in fact pull away in that fourth quarter and got the victory and looks like they will be the number one seed in the Western conference. One sixteen, one Oh seven against the Minnesota Timberwolves, which means that they also are going to look like they were on their way, <clears throat> excuse me, to win the division as well in the Northwest three teams in the Northwest division, Scott 55 plus wins. I don't remember the last time I've ever, I've seen that happen or if it's ever happened in NBA, but uh, what are your takeaways from that? At least that wolves and the nuggets game last night. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, it's Jokic's world. We're all living in it. That's yeah. kind of the main takeaway there. Uh, people on Twitter have been trying to make cases for Luka to an MVP. I'll put it this way. I think that it should be a bigger discussion than it actually is. But Jokic is minus 3,000. Yeah. Like, as far as I'm concerned, yesterday was the icing on the cake mm -hmm. for Denver uh, to potentially get the one seed and to really just cement Joker winning MVP. Once again, I feel like there's a misconception on basketball social media where people think that their general opinions on who should, keyword should, win the award actually matters. That, that does not matter. It doesn't matter yeah. who you think should win the award. The voters are probably going to give it to Joker. That's why the mm -hmm. odds are this big. Guy dropped 40, what do you have, 41, 11, and 7 on 80% shooting as the number one defense in the league with the yeah. one seat on the line on yeah. national TV. And Luca, the game prior, because both games were actually on ESPN, Luca really wasn't that great. His numbers were fine. I think he had 29, 9, and 9. He shot below 40% from the floor. He was in foul trouble the entire first half, and Dallas was still up 20 because Kyrie was carrying the offense in that first half. I'll put it this way. I think Joker's going to win MVP. I think it's a foregone conclusion. It was a really bad night for people making cases for Luka. Both, team, both players were on national TV, and Joker clearly outplayed Luka against a better team with bigger stakes. I think it was the official stamp. I think it was already decided. I think most of the voters made up their mind already. But yeah. I think that was the official coronation of who's going to win MVP. You? Yeah, I mean, I, there's not much, I think, really to talk about here. I, although people want to make the case for Luka because maybe there's just some fatigue with Nikola Jokic. But, there is disrespect, I mean, though. Like, the straw sure. poll having Luka behind Shea is offensive. Luka should clearly be ahead of Shea. I'm, I think I, so, I too. think that Shea is easily the third-place finisher here. But you can argue season-wise, Luka's done more, all this other argument. The only case Luka had was if he finished the regular season on fire, which he has, mm -hmm. and Denver did not get the one seed. Yeah. And Denver now is in line for the one seed. If Joker puts up this stat line, puts up 40-plus in change against the team he's competing with for that division, yeah. on national TV, once again, I just feel like it was a spot where Joker's going to win. I think it's already decided. People are still kind of in denial about it. But yeah. in reality, I think that was the official stamp. If Luka dropped 50 last night and Joker dropped like 22 and they lost to Minnesota, maybe you have a recency bias argument in favor of Luka. I don't even think you have that anymore. I just think it's over. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, it's minus 3,000 right now on DraftKings for Jokic to win MVP. Luka's 15 to 1 and then Shea's at 25 to 1. And, you know, what did hurt Shea was missing those games with that quad injury where. I yeah. think that this would be a different conversation, like you mentioned, that if Denver wasn't the number one seed, that maybe it would be a closer race between Luka and SGA for MVP. But I 100% I agree with you with last night, the performance that Jokic put up in 41 points on 60% shooting, 16 of 20 from the floor, uh, and you know, getting a win not only for a number one seed, potentially more than likely, but it was against a division opponent as well. So it's not only that they're getting the number one seed, obviously, but they're also winning that division within a team in a division, like we mentioned, 55 plus win for three teams in that division. So impressive stuff from and this Jokic Denver Nuggets carrying, team. Yeah. Which is, I have to mention there. It's not like Jamal Murray dropped 45 last night. Joker was the best player on the floor. He yeah. shot 16 of 20 mm -hmm. against the current minus 2,000. D I mean, Gobert didn't exactly guard him, to be fair. He was kind of in more of a help defense approach, but yeah. you're against the best defense in the league, the best defensive rating by a mile, and you torched them for the entire game. I, I can't look past that. I understand people make the case that Luka 
deserves more consideration, and maybe he should win. Maybe he should. But a reminder, this is why award markets are my favorite markets to bet. None of the narratives actually matter. The question is, do you think the voters are going to give the award to one guy or the other? The, they've already announced, basically in the ESPN straw poll, Joker's winning. Yeah. So e- regardless of what you think is going to happen, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. There's really nothing yeah. left to chance. Joker's going to win the award. It's going to happen. I know people argue Dallas is like 17-1 and one in the last 18. They've been in great form. I get it. Once again, the people that vote have decided already Joker's winning. That's the point. So regardless of what you think should happen, it has no impact on the betting markets and it has no impact on the actual trophy cases of these guys. Joker's winning. That's kind of my point. I'm basically trying to tell you, if you're trying to bet Luka to win MVP, I think you're donating money. Yeah. Because he's not winning. I and mean, I think that for Dallas, they would have to at least have been a, at minimum, a, a top three seed for them to... For Luka to win MVP, because right now you take a look at it, they're at the fifth spot. I mean, it would have to take, I think the last time I remember a guy that won MVP, that was like a sixth spot, I want to say was Russell Westbrook. But that was because he had a... Joker won one year. Joker was a sixth, but uh, Murray missed the entire season, and Porter Jr. played like nine games. So that was a big reason for that. Yeah. And then the year that Russ won, that was the year that he broke the record for most triple doubles uh, in a single season. So it was something historic that he did for him to win that MVP and get his team into the playoffs. So, I mean, I think we already party. I mean, we knew that us, us discussing this over the past several weeks, especially when the betting, the betting market and the odds are have significantly shifted towards Nikola Jokic at minus three thousand. So, um, yeah, he's well on his way to win his what third MVP now, fourth MVP, I believe, third MVP. Uh, of the regular season. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, anything I else want from to, last night? Uh, I want to touch yeah. on uh, one or two more things. First of yeah, all, sure. uh, it's going to be MVP related. I see L cool asking if I saw the poll or submitted votes. I don't really know if I've seen it. ESPN does this straw poll every year where they take media members. I think each of them have votes. I think I'm not sure if they all have votes or some of them do, but some they do a I last think. like checkpoint of who should be MVP. And Joker got 85 of the 100 first place votes. Luca got one first place vote. Now, I think that's insane. That's extremely disrespectful. That's where I think there's a problem. I think Luca's going to get second. But if, if you pull 100 media members that have a say in the MVP race and 85 of them pick Joker to be the MVP, you're not flipping about 40 people in the span of two weeks. Yeah. It's not happening. Like, Joker's going to win. I just think it's a foregone conclusion. It's why the odds, despite all of the media buzz, isn't it a red flag that Luke is getting all the hype on Twitter, all the hype on social media, and Joker's minus 3,000? Isn't that a problem? Like, isn't yeah. that a serious problem for gambling purposes, for people that are kind of chasing Luca? The odds makers have spoken. There's basically no chance of Luca's winning the award. Yeah. Um, do you, I mean, you take a look. Right now, and I'm, I was trying to find the PRA for these guys, but I, ESPN doesn't list that anymore for whatever reason. But it's usually been <clears throat> guys that are number one and something similar to MLB, where typically the guy that has the best war wins above a replacement, wins MVP. And with M- for the, uh, the NBA, it was obviously the guy that was number one in player efficiency rating, and they don't have that stat anymore listed. <clears throat> excuse me, on. Uh, ESPN, but I mean, look, like you mentioned that if they're taking these polls and these media members that actually do have an MVP vote vote and are already picking Jokic prior to what transpired last night, I think like you mentioned that it's that just a cherry on top for this like, sorry for this, uh, for Nikola Jokic to win MVP. And I think I, I, I I don't think it's a, it's a conversation, but again, like you mentioned, that we can talk about it all we want. Apparently, it's not a conversation. That's kind of the point. I think it sh- I think it should be a conversation, but according to the media uh-huh. and according to the betting markets, there is no conversation. Joker's winning. That's kind of my point. It feels like, uh, once again, it's kind of a roasting of the entire award process where media members made up their mind two months ago on who mm-hmm. should win MVP. But my point that I'm trying to make is my opinion and all of your opinions on the actual award does not matter. There is no angle 
The angle is who do you think the actual voters are picking? And based on the odds, they're picking Joker. And based on the straw poll, which is historically accurate, they're picking Joker. That's my point. And I it's think also it's the fact that people may have a bias that they're holding those Luca tickets that they want Luca to win to cash their tickets. Yeah, because he was twenty five to one, thirty to one. Sure. To be honest, I might be a bit biased because I had a preseason parlay. I yeah. have Wemby Rookie of the Year parlay with, with uh, Joker MVP. Yeah. But trying to view it unbiasedly, if you tell me, I, first of all, I love betting the award markets every year because mm-hmm. it kind of cuts through all the Twitter hype and all the social media hype because yeah. the voters are kind of predictable and most of them maybe maybe not Stephen A, don't actually watch basketball on a regular basis. That's kind of a separate mm-hmm. point, but I just think he's going to win. It matters to us for the sake of talking about it, but for the sake yeah. of trying to trying to predict who's going to win the award, all this Twitter stuff that's in favor of Luca probably is not going to matter in hindsight. That's kind of my point. Yeah. Uh, what else you got for anything from last night you want to mention? Uh, I thought it was... Uh, it's kind of back to the MVP talk because a lot of the games, I don't know. I don't want to say they didn't matter because the Suns held on to win against the Clippers, but mm-hmm. that was, it was hilarious. They were down like after three quarters. Shout out to Nurkic though, who had three points, 19 rebounds and 10 assists. So shout out to Nurkic for one of the weirder stat lines I've seen all year. But I think for the sake of everything else, I said that if you were betting on Cleveland minus 18 and a half, and you won, I would fly to whatever to your location. I would shake your hand. Not going to happen because Cleveland didn't cover. So apologies there if you were hoping to meet me. Uh, Thunder killed the Spurs. I thought they'd win by 40. They won by 38. I thought Milwaukee would win. Orlando is in really bad form. Yeah. I don't trust Orlando right now. They can't score. Defensively, they've been struggling. So I have some issues uh, with that team going into the playoffs. And they've also really fumbled their seating. Orlando's really had some issues against some pretty weak competition. Milwaukee's gotten better pretty much since they put Beverly into the starting lineup. He's kind of helped them defensively, but nothing really else to add. I don't want to get into any more MVP talk, but I have to at least mention one thing because they've been doing this recent like simulcast on, I think it's ESPN or ABC with Kevin Hart and how he's had some guests on. He had a, they did the play in tournament final with the Lakers and the Pacers. You know what I'm talking about? Kevin Hart yeah. hosting this like simulcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, ha- so we had on Cedric the Entertainer uh, yesterday and during the game. And they're talking about how they think that, or Cedric said, I think SGA should win MVP because he's had a great season. So Shaq thinks that Hart said Joker should stop winning MVPs because it's bad for the league, which is just offensive in its own right. That's just ridiculous. But is it a race thing? That Shaq comes out, Cedric comes out, Kevin Hart comes out, and they're all just anti-white European guys. I think this also started with Gilbert Arenas, and this could get like really touchy and and could derail the wrong way. Um, but I think it has to be a race related, right? I just don't know how you can watch Luca and Joker for the last couple of weeks with Shea being on the shelf. Shea's been injured for the yeah. last two weeks, and say, "Oh yeah, Shea's definitely MVP." Like, what are you watching? It's not even close. Shea had a really good season up until his quad injury, which yeah. held him out for what? Um, a week or so, maybe a, a little two, more. They're not going to get the one seed. So Joe yeah. is going to probably beat them in the standings. If you want to make a case for Luca, okay. Shea, I don't even understand the case for Shea anymore. Yeah, so there was that stretch after the Utah game where 23, I mean, again, a lot of it is sometimes is based off of stats and things, but the thing was that OKC was still winning games without him on the floor. And when we talk about MVP, like you take Jokic off of this Denver team, are they a play in tournament team or do they make the playoffs with that Jokic? Uh, what do you think? I mean, Murray's gets injured assuming every everybody's year. healthy. Yeah, I was going to say Murray gets injured every year, though. That's kind of the problem, but yeah. Playoffs, probably. Yeah, they'd be a playoff team. What about Luka? I mean, it depends if you think Kyrie could carry or not. I think Dallas would be like a play-in team. Yeah. If so, goes out. And I think it's also significant that when we talk about when you take Jokic off the floor for this Denver team, how bad their offense looks. And I think that people are just tired of having the same winner over and over again. Where it's 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 even though even I, though a Joker did not win last year for for, yeah. for the record, but yeah, and Joel Embiid deserved it last year, right? Even though that 
Jokic had a better year last year than he did when he won the MVP the former the the prior year is what I'm trying to say. I don't want to get into the race thing, but it, again, it does you know sometimes feel like that these and again I keep on referencing Gilbert Arenas because he actually came out and said that he says what in so many words he said what European players are bad yeah. for the NBA I don't, I don't product. remember if Gilbert Arenas said specifically he would pick Shea to win MVP. That's why I didn't include him. He might have. It yeah. wouldn't surprise me if he did. But I'm just wondering because I just don't know how SJ still has an argument because overall season numbers, I think we'd agree Joka and Luka's numbers are better than Shea. The seeding's not going to be there for OKC anymore because they're not going to catch Denver. And yeah. if you want to go recency bias, Luka and Joker clear Shea because Shea's been injured. Yeah. So I don't even know what argument Shea has anymore. And it's also the fact that their head coach is like a minus, what, some odd thousand? Yeah, to yeah. win coach of the year. So I don't remember a time, at least ever since I've watched basketball, that I've had a head coach and a player on the same team win awards of coach of the year and MVP, right? Because, I can actually think about that for a second. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you could look, you probably have to look it up. And I, I mean, I don't remember in recent memory, at least, at least off the top of my head, but. I don't think Steph I think, and Kerr overlapped, but potentially, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But also the fact that you take a look at this Thunder team year over year, they've improved by 15 games in each of the last two seasons. I think a lot of that also has to do with coaching. Yeah, that's fair. So I think for SGA, like we mentioned, that stretch where he had, where he was out and he was injured, and even when he was playing through it, like he wasn't putting up the numbers that Jokic is pulling. So Again, it could be a race thing, you know, for guys, you know, that are mentioning that SGA should be MVP. I, 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 I can't buy into that argument right now after what's, you know, transpired at the until end of March because, I mean, you kind of just go through his log, 12 points, 24 points, 19 points. He was having really bad shooting nights, shooting well below 50% in those games. And I think th I do understand that Shea has to, a lot to do with the success of what the Thunder have had this season. But I think for me, it's more so that it's that the head coach has a lot more to do with it than SGA does for the Oklahoma City Thunder team, if that if that is the case. So, you know, I, I again, I, you know, Jack and these guys coming out saying that maybe, you know, people want to say it's a race card thing that they don't want. I'm just saying it's not even a discussion. If they want to have yeah. a discussion, that's fine. But when you say Joker winning MVPs is bad for the league and Luca's in the middle of playing Miami and you're yeah. saying, oh, I'm picking Shea. Like, what are we doing here? Like, like, that's not even a discussion. You're just dismissing two guys, and you're just picking the lone black candidate to potentially win the award, which I find maybe it could be because of race, but I just think it's kind of weird, isn't it? At least for basketball discussion. There is no discussion. You're yeah. just dismissing two guys immediately. Um, Just to ask, though, I see cool mentioning stats that I should get into. I'm going to warn you, Shea's not going to win pretty much any of these stats. Uh, Luca leading the league in points by over three points per game. Shea's tied with Giannis. If you want to get into the actual assists, I can guarantee you Shea's not winning that category either. Uh, but to go into the numbers, I got to quickly uh, filter here. Uh, so, okay, so assists. It. Halliburton leads. Joker's is, th uh, sorry, Luca's second at 9.8. Joker's third at nine. Shea is currently not even in the top 30. Uh, no, sorry, he's top nine. Sorry, he's 19th. So Shea's not in the top 18 in assists. If you want to go for generic numbers. So points Luca hasn't beat. Assists, Luca and Joker have him beat. Rebound, Shea's definitely not even close, uh, so that's not an argument either. Three-point shooting, uh, yeah, we know Shea doesn't take many of those, but I don't know what stats you want me to use. Once again, if we're going just based on generic stats, Shea's not even close to these guys. So I don't I don't know what stats we're even talking about at this point. Yeah, and I think the only category that SGA may have him beat in Luca is, is field goal percentage. Yeah, that's um, fair. I think that... And maybe free throw attempts. Well, Luca yeah. Luca might actually be close, but I think Shea beats him in free throw attempts. Because I do see Nicola shot fifty eight point one percent. Shea was at fifty three point nine. Uh, Luca is not even in the top thirty. So let me, I mean, let me just filter this back. I, I, I realize we also spent only twenty five minutes talking about this, so apologies. Forty eight point seven for picks, but <laughs> my point is once again, cool. If you want to make a case for Shea to an MVP, it's fine. But when you're saying pull up numbers and every number says that Luca and Joker are better than Shea, I don't know what your argument is. Like, what number says Shea's better than Luca and, and Joker? There are no numbers that suggest that. Yeah, that's why sure I was mentioning Luca's defensive numbers. And I mean, if you want to go uh, look up 
uh, Luca's oh, Dallas's defensive rating. Aren't they number one in the league in the last 11 games? Yes, but I think it gets even better without Luca on the floor for this. Um, that wouldn't surprise this me. But, team. Yeah, but when is that? When has defense ever mattered for the MVP since like Dwight Howard? Nobody yeah. cares. Nobody talks about defense. The last decade. Defensive player of the year award. So, yeah. All right, let's Scott. Let's put a pin in that. I think this would be a good conversation in the off season. Uh, Sorry, I kind of well. ranted there. No, no, but... no. You're good. Um, and again, there's only five games here tonight in the association. So, before we get into the games here for tonight, uh, let me tell everyone about our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. You play the pick em game. Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in this week's games for a chance to win big. Pick between two and five players to build their pick em entry. And stay tuned at the end of the episode. Scott and I will put together our Underdog Fantasy entry here for tonight. Sign up today with our promo code NBASGPN to get your first deposit doubled up to $100, as well as an instant pick em special. Visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store. And don't forget to register with our code NBASGPN to get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Must be 18 years or older and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply concern with your play. Call 1-800-522-4700 or visit www.ncpgambling.org. All right, Scott, let's get into the games here for tonight. We'll start off with the first game here on the schedule. We've got the Chicago Bulls. They are in the Motor City to take on the Detroit Pistons. Um, nine and a half is the number right now for the Bulls on the road as a favorite. Total of 220. Looking at the injury report for the Chicago Bulls, Alex Caruso is probable. Andre Drummond is doubtful. Ayodesumo is questionable. For the Detroit Pistons, Cade Cunningham is questionable. Uh, Simon Fontecchio is out. Quentin Grimes is out. Isaiah Stewart is out. Uh, Asur Thompson is out. And that is pretty much it. Uh, Chicago is, I mean, we know they're going to end up as the ninth or 10th seed. Let me put up their exact number. Yeah, so they're number nine right now. I think that if they win here tonight, they'll clinch that first road game sorry home game against the atlanta hawks for that first play in tournament game detroit we know their season is pretty much uh over here but it was over when it started yeah nine and a half the number right now for the chicago bulls on the road here scott i mean i hate laying big numbers with the bulls because why would i ever want to do that so i guess i'm automatically considering the pistons of course this team sucks I think I'm going to lean to Chicago just based on Detroit kind of getting killed recently. I'm not going to bet this game. If you bet this game, you should probably go to a meeting. I'm not going to fly to shake your hand if you bet the Bulls and you win this game. It's not like Cleveland laying 19 and a half last night, but damn, I really don't want to bet either side in this game. Uh, I think the Bulls are going to cover, but I can't bet it. Um, the Bulls are eight and two straight up. Six and four against the spread and eight and two towards the over as an away favorite this season. I think that if you want to bet the Bulls, maybe just take them in the first half. And, you know, I think they just come out strong, take care of business. There may be a possibility where the Pistons could backdoor this thing. But again, with the lack of bodies available, and if K doesn't end up playing in this game, it might just turn into um, a very difficult course for the Detroit Pistons here. I did the same thing the other, I think you and I did the show on Tuesday where I just took Denver in the first half. They covered the number, but. I, I want to say that third quarter got a little interesting before the Denver Nuggets were able to pull away. So just get in and get out with your money, at least for myself. So uh, I'll take the Bulls in the first half here uh, on the spread. Total is 220 in this game. Scott, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> no, not really. I guess I'm going to lean over, I, I guess, because Chicago's defense has been kind of up and down recently. But no, I really don't want to talk or bet this game. I'm not going to give you much valuable information here because the Bulls are a psycho team and the Pistons suck. Mm. Yeah. So like, I, I don't really know what I'm supposed to read into for this game. Do you? I, I didn't. I, I mean, I couldn't. I'm not going to be watching this game. I'll check the final score, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, the fourth and final meeting between these two teams this season, two out of the three games have gone over the total. Any player props you want to look at in this game, if you have anything? Uh, so for player props in this game, I do think that Kobe White or DeRozan might be intriguing in this matchup because 
Uh, we know Detroit's defense has not been good by any means. Rim protection has been an issue. They got met to and Durin probably as their starting front court, which is probably not a good sign. We know Vucevic should dominate on the glass, but he never actually tries to rebound, which is kind of annoying. Do you want to make a case for Drummond off the bench if we actually uh, – Drummond actually might not play. I can't even make yeah, a case Yeah, he's doubtful. For yeah. yeah, so I can't even make that case. I think I'm going to look for either DeRozan or Kobe White points. I just see a bunch of mismatches. Is Cade going to play? Nobody knows. Like, nobody knows if he's playing or not, so I can't make a case for Detroit. Yeah, I'll uh, lean to DeRozan or Kobe White points, maybe both. Yeah, uh, Drummond officially uh, doubtful here today in this game, and we'll see if uh, K does, in fact, end up playing in this game or not. But um, uh, Jalen Dern rebounds has been really good to me this season. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, um, that number's at 10.5 at plus 105. DeMar DeRozan, you mentioned the last two games against this Pistons team, 29 points and 25 points. But again, there's also the possibility that this could turn into a blowout and they don't have DeMar DeRozan out there. So I won't have a, many player props in this game. That's for sure. Uh, Durin rebounds, gonna, I like. For, for reference. Durin rebounds. I, I got to yeah. include that because we know Vucevic is pretty soft. Yeah. All right, let's get to the next game here, Scott. We've got the New York Knicks. They are in Boston to take on the Celtics. Currently, as it stands, the Knicks are a two-and-a-half-point Road favorite here with a total of 215. Looking at the injury report for the New York Knicks, clean injury report. Only player that we know is out uh, for sure is going to be Julius Randle. For the Boston Celtics, a lot of questionable tags. So all five of your starters are questionable here today. Xavier Tillman also coming off the bench is questionable. So I, I think that you and I talked about this in the Tuesday episode that give credit to boss of the way that they've been able to rotate these guys in and out of guys who's playing in the game or not. But this is a big game for the New York Knicks as far as a seeding goes in the Eastern conference, right? We already know Boston's locked up. They have nothing to play for clinched the Eastern conference a while back, clinched the bets record. So right now for the New York Knicks, they are half a game above the Cleveland Cavaliers for the third spot right now. So if the, the playoffs started today, they would play the Indiana Pacers. So two and a half is the number right now, uh, Scott, for the Knicks in Boston. What do you think? I don't know who's playing for Boston. It looks like they're sitting the entire team. I mentioned this with you a couple days ago. Boston's at a point where they basically wrapped up the one seat a month ago. Yeah. And they're just messing around. Mm -hmm. That's why they had a game with zero free throw attempts, because who cares? Yeah. I still think there was an unwritten coaches agreement between Missoula and Doc Rivers where it was just like, let's get out of here. Like, like let's just not foul each other. Like, we got better places to be. But <laughs> I – isn't it, I mean, two free throws in the entire game. That tells you that I don't think – that the Celtics were taking the game seriously. But yeah. I'm going to lean Knicks. I think they care more. Seating's still up in the air. They have a shot at the three. Uh, do they have a shot at the two? I don't remember. They're one and a half games out, but because Milwaukee won their last uh, two games here, I think that yeah. really created the separation for them. But so they would need, yeah, they're fighting for three. So I think that if they win here tonight, um, that they should be obviously in the driver's seat for the three spot because the Knicks have three more games left and the Cavs only have two more games left. So they'll be one game clear of the Cavs at the three spot with two games left to play for each team. Yeah, um, I have to go with the Knicks. I just think they care more. You can argue it's momentum. You can argue that it's going to be a spot where the Knicks care more, so motivation. But it's kind of motivation and momentum right now. The Celtics are bored. Yeah. They're the one word I'd use. Like They're not playing for anything. So yeah. I, I'm going to lean Knicks. Yeah, and the Knicks are a team that were struggling, right? And now they have all their guys healthy. I mean, like we mentioned, no Julius Randle for the rest of the year. But they got OG and Obi back. And right now it's probably the time where Tom Thibodeau is like, hey, we got to start playing some good basketball and we got to carry that momentum into that, into the playoffs, whether we do play Orlando or whether we play Indiana uh, in that first round. So uh, yeah, I'm all over the Knicks here. I do love the Knicks here tonight. Minus the two and a half. Do uh, you have anything on the total in this game here? Uh, I'm going to lean over. I'm not sure Boston's going to care defensively. And I think both yeah. these teams can score. I mean, I linked to the over in the Knicks game against Chicago and both teams shot. I think it was above like 54%. Mm -hmm. So I am just going to lean to the over in this game. Yeah, I think that, again, if Boston's not playing much defense, I think Knicks still play some type of defense because they pride themselves on that. If you want to look at a Knicks team total over, I couldn't talk you off of that in this game. 
Player props, the only one I'm looking at is it's going to be Jalen Brunson on his points. I mean, we know that he's pretty much the offense right now. I think that number was at 27 and a half or 26 and a half. Definitely shop around. Uh, but currently, as it stands right now, Jalen Brunson is at, oh, sorry, sorry, it's up to 30 and a half. I don't know why I said 27 and a half, but 30 and a half right now is a number uh, for him. I mean, he's he's just been on a tear, man. It's just like I can't I couldn't talk you into an under with Jalen Brunson unless this game is a blowout. But dude's been balling. He's averaging 35.6 points per game over the last five games coming off of four straight games where uh, Scott, he scored 35 plus and the back to back games. He's put up 43 or more points, 43 against the Bucks, 45 against the Chicago Bulls. So. Uh, he's on another planet right now is uh, Jalen Brunson, though. That would be the only play that I would have in this game. Do you have anything for so, player props? I just want to ask the all NBA teams are positionalist now, right? I believe so. I think can Brunson get first team? <sighs> and then the question becomes like, who do you put him over? I mean, the point is positions don't matter anymore. So in theory, you could just stack up a bunch of points. I mean, some people or voters are going to stick with the original the format for some integrity. Yeah. In some mm -hmm. tradition. So, yeah. for example, people can argue Tatum's going to be first team because mm -hmm. he was an MVP candidate, never had a chance of winning, but people were making the case. Yep. Based on how the last couple of months have gone, it's kind of working against Tatum that Boston's so far ahead of everyone, they haven't had to try. If you had to pick right now who deserves first team more, Tatum or Brunson, who'd you take? I think Brunson's I think got a case. Yeah, Brunson definitely has the case, but I think because... The Boston Celtics were so dominant in the regular season. They're going to give it to Tatum anyway. That they are going to give it to Tatum. And again, Tatum has a, I mean, a whole hell of a lot to do with all the success that Boston has had this season. So it would be, I understand the argument from Brunson, but it, they, they would just give it to, to Tatum. Uh, the point is, I think Brunson will be second team. Yeah, for sure. NBA, but you can make the argument, maybe with positionalists, he can make a case for some first place votes. Yeah. I don't think he's getting in. But some first team votes, I think it'll be second team. I think Tatum will be first team. But if you yeah. had to kick somebody out, you know, Luca's first team, you know, Shea's first team, you know, Joker's first team, you can go down the line. Most of the positions I think we'd agree are kind of wrapped up at this point. Yeah. But I think Brunson, you can make an argument as a case to sneak in. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't talk you off of that, especially the way that he was able to carry this team with all the injuries that they dealt with. With OG, with Jalen Brunson, sorry, with uh, Julius Randle being out, with uh, Mitchell Robinson being out. So, yeah, the 100% there's a case for Jalen Brunson uh, for all, MB, or all NBA first team. Uh, player props, do you have anything from the Knicks side? I don't see anything listed for Boston. I don't, well, they don't know who's playing for Boston. Yeah. So, when everyone gets ruled out, I'll consider Peyton Pritchard and maybe Sam Hauser uh, if I had okay. to go for some alternatives there. But I think Brunson has a big game. Uh, trying to think if this. I mean, the Knicks might blow them out. If Boston is going to sit everybody like we think they might, then the Knicks might coast in this game. So, yeah, I mean, Brunson, I think, might go for 30 and change. Uh, Josh Hart rebounds might be tempting, like it always is. But I do think that you're looking at a spot where probably Brunson has a monster game. All right, before we get over to the next game on the schedule, let me tell everyone about the newest sponsor, on the Sports Gambling Podcast Network, that's going to be AVO. We're proud to partner up with AVO, the premier sports betting arbitrage tool. If you're new to arbitrage sports betting, it's very simple. Basically, pitting, betting both sides of a bet at two different sports books to lock in a profit. The AVO tool scans the sports books looking for discrepancies in the odds and then tells you how much money you need to place with each sports book and the expected profit. The total is the tool is super easy to use and lightning fast as speed is the big part of arbitrage sports betting. The best part about AVO is it's currently free to use without any restrictions. That's right, completely free. Get started today at arbs versus odds.com. Again, that's arbs versus odds.com. A R B S V S odds.com. All right, Scott, let's get to the next game on the schedule. We have my Houston Rockets. They are in Utah here tonight to take on the Jazz. Currently, as it stands, the Rockets are a 10.5-point road favorite here with a total of 228. 
Looking at the injury report, start here with the Rockets. The usual suspects are going to be out. Steven Adams, Tari Easton, Shane Goon, Jay Sean Tate. Uh, Amen Thompson is available for the Rockets here tonight. For the Utah Jazz, guys that are out, Colin Sexton, Lori Markkinen, Walker Kessler, Chris Dunn, John Collins, and Jordan Clarkson. So most starters and the key bench pieces all out here for <coughs> excuse me, Utah. Feels like the Rockets and the Jazz are playing each other every other week here, but this will be the, I believe, the fourth and final matchup here this season. Let me double check. Uh, I or think it, might it just is. Be... There's, only like, there's only three games left. No, I was, I was making sure it was either going to be third, the third game or the fourth game, but it's the fourth game uh, this season between these two teams. Rockets 3-0 straight up. They're only 1-2 and two against the spread. The total is 2-1 uh, to and one to the over. We did see these two teams match up on March 29th. In that stretch where the stretch where the Rockets had that winning streak going, uh, trying to catch the Golden State Warriors, obviously that got derailed very quickly after they started playing some quality opponents. Uh, but the last game was in Utah, 101-100 victory. But prior to that, Scott, I mean, they were a pretty high scoring games, 127-126, 147-119 here. But let's start with the spread. Rockets laying 10 and a half here against the Jazz. I mean, Utah's punted on the entire season, but they did hang in there for a little while against Denver. I Houston has been showing some pride recently, uh, or at least for one game, arguably two, because they should have beaten Dallas, but they were, they were still alive at that point. I think it's more just a sign of Orlando being really bad right now. So I'm going to lean Utah plus the points. They've still been decent at home this season. Uh, they're 20 and 20, but when your team only has 29 wins, that's actually a pretty decent home record. Uh, Houston has done well uh, in all three meetings. They are 3-0, and but two of the meetings were decided by one point. So I'm going to lean Utah to keep it close. We know Houston season is over. We know Utah season's over already. I'm not laying 10 and a half in a meaningless game. I'll lean to Utah plus the points. Yeah, I don't, I'm not really on board with laying 10 and a half with the Rockets. It's not the same this. as the Nets Raptors game yesterday, but it's the same idea. Like, why would I want to lay double digits when the game doesn't matter for either team? Yeah. And I think my more favorite play in this game is actually going to be the over of the number right now would I say 228 I feel like this number is a little low these two teams are the worst defensive rated teams over the last five games Utah the worst Rockets the second worst um I know they don't play with a lot of pace but I think this might be a game where again defense is not going to be at the top of the priority list the Rockets have they've been okay offensively they're number 13 Utah and obviously with missing all their guys or key guys here um haven't been able to score a whole hell of a lot of points. And again, you look at pace. Rockets were playing with a lot of pace, but that has tailed off where they're middle of the pack now. But I just think that this is going to be a game where we do see points being put up, especially with how bad these two defenses are. And like I mentioned, the first two meetings this season did go over the total. And I do understand that Utah had their key guys in there to put up the points in that game. But um, I think we see some up and down in this game here. So I would like the over of 228 here. You have any thoughts on the total? I like the over too. Uh, any player props? I think I got to go to Van Vliet. He's been really good. Uh, Jalen's cooled off recently, and Van Vliet's yeah. kind of taken over as being the, I don't want to say main offensive threat, but he's been really good uh, for the last week and change. So I don't mind Van Vliet, uh, maybe for points in this game. If you want to go for assists at seven and a half, I maybe would not mind that either. Uh, but recently, the points have been really good. His point number's at 17 and a half. Really? 17 and a half, he had 37 against Orlando, 24 against Dallas. Give me the over on Van Vliet, and that's a crazy number. Yeah, I think it, I've seen this with Van Vliet. He comes out and has a really good shooting night, and then he just kind of falls on his face like the fall. Well, that's what he is. Game. That's why yeah. I, I didn't like Houston paying them all that much money because he's a low 40% field goal shooter his entire yeah. career. But it's a low number for a guy that dro just dropped 37. Now he's against Utah. 17 and a half. He's a chucker, but he shoots a lot. Yeah, the volume is definitely going to be there for a guy like Fred Van Vliet. Um, I was looking at Cam Whitmore. It's at 12 and a half for his points prop, but he only played six minutes in the game against Orlando, which makes me a little bit of nervous. Um, the one maybe other player you want to look at is probably Jabari. The inconsistencies with him kind of make me nervous just because of the number of the shot volume sometimes isn't there for him, but his number right now is at, let's see, what did I just see that? Seven, sorry, 14 and a half for Jabari. He's gone over this number in four of the last five games, He's averaging right around this number against the Utah Jazz. So I think Jabari is in line to have a pretty good game here 
against the Utah Jazz. So Jabari, Cam Whitmore is the ones I would consider. I think the obvious one, Scott, for the Utah is probably Keontae George. As if you want to take his points prop uh, over or if you want to take a look at some combination of like assists or threes or something like that. Yep. All right. You got anything else? No, not really. All right. Next game on the schedule, we've got the Golden State Warriors. They are in Portland here tonight to take on the Blazers. Currently, as it stands, the Warriors are a 13 and a half point favorite with a total of 222. Looking at the injury report for the Warriors, Draymond and Clay Thompson are questionable for this game. Both are dealing with right knee um, injuries. Soreness yeah, soreness. Okay. Well, I think we'll classify it at that. For the Portland Trail Blazers, what I will do to make our lives easier, just read off who the starters are projected to be in this game here. So give me one second. Uh, so for the Portland Trail Blazers, we've got Scoot Henderson. Uh, we got Ryan Rupert, Chris Humphrey, Jabari Walker, and DeAndre Ayton. So everybody else is pretty much out. The Jeremy Grants and Malcolm Brogdon, Sam Anthony Simons, the Matisse Thibels of the world. Uh, we talked about the Warriors, Scott, as far as the standings go. They could get into the ninth seed. They're a game behind Sacramento for the eighth seed. Um, but I think 13, 13 and a half is a number here, man. What do you think? I'm actually going to lean to Portland in this game. I think the spread's too big. Yeah, It's actually a really bad scheduling spot for Golden State. Because not only do they play this game, but they play at home against New Orleans tomorrow. Yeah. That's a massive game. It is. Looking at the last three games that Golden State has on the schedule, they play Portland on the road, New Orleans at home, and Utah at home. So basically two buys and a tough opponent. Mm -hmm. I think Clay and Draymond are not playing to keep them healthy for that New Orleans game tomorrow. And there's some look ahead to it. I, I just think you're looking at a spot where. Golden State might win the game, but I think I think they will be shorthanded. And we saw Portland kind of hang in there recently. They almost covered against Boston. They might have covered depending on what line you got. They were beating New Orleans at halftime. They actually mm -hmm. were competitive in that game. They lost by ten. But I'm gonna lean. I'm gonna lean Portland here. I just think that for scheduling spots, having New Orleans on deck when you basically need to win out to have any shot of making a potential. Uh, seven or eight spot in order to avoid the nine ten play in game. I think it's a look at spot. So I'm going to link to Portland. The Warriors have actually been really good on front end of back to backs, 12 and four straight up and 13 and three against the spread. I think this might be a good game to have a live play because if the Warriors are not serious in the first half, We'll see that typical third quarter for the Warriors where they do pull away. But again, like you mentioned, I think that Clay, in fact, ends up sitting in this game and possibly Draymond. Um, so right now, and I know we'll talk about the last game that has is probably the game of the it is going to be the game of the night with the huge playoff seeding implications. I'm gonna in play this game. I agree with you. I'll I'll lean with the Blazers full game, but again, if I do see the Warriors. I don't want to say they'd be trailing at half, but they're only if they're only up by a couple points, maybe like by two possessions. I think that's where they come out in the third quarter and do you know warrior stings in the third quarter. So uh in play for me, but full game all lean with the uh Blazers in this game. We've seen the fourth yeah. quarter so many times. Golden State's up 20, they pull everyone, we get some point spread shenanigans at the end, and maybe a backdoor cover. But 13 and a half's a lot when you have a playoff opponent up next the following day. That's a series look at spot. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely keep that in mind. Again, make sure you check this injury report for the Warriors because, again, like we mentioned, Draymond and Clay are on there as far as questionable tags right now. Anything on the total? 222? I'm going to lean over. If I think that Golden State might not be fully focused for this game, I know Portland can't guard anybody. So, I'll lean to the over in this game. Yeah, I think the over is a play here. Again, Portland's not playing a whole heck of a lot of defense. Uh, let me just double check here. So Portland, they're actually number 11 uh, in defensive rating over the last five games. Golden State right behind them at number 12. But I, I think that the Warriors right now are just kick, clicking offensively where they're number four in offensive rating over the last five games. And I just want to quickly see how these 
teams have matched up this season, at least what the Warriors have done scoring wise against the Trailblazers here. So this season, uh, let me put that as one word. So Trailblazers. So Warriors three and zero straight up, one and two against spread, two and one towards the under, only averaging one hundred and eighteen points per game in that span. So. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll lean with the over, but I'm not going to have an official play on that. Any player props you're targeting in this game um, on the Blazers side or maybe for the Warriors? I mean, I'd be tempted by eight and rebounds, but I don't know if uh, I I can't trust them against Golden State. I think I have to be tempted by Trace Jackson Davis in this game, because if I think Draymond's going to sit, which he might, because once again, New Orleans is up tomorrow. Jackson Davis is going to play a lot of minutes, and we know that he is a very solid energy guy who's given them very good minutes uh, ever since he kind of joined the starting lineup, and that's kind of one of the main adjustments that they ended up making was giving him a more prominent role with the roster. But you're looking at his current numbers for this game, and his rebounds are set at 7.5, which I think is pretty low. If you want to go for double-double in this game, once again, if Draymond does not play, he will have more opportunities. Plus 380? Really? Good number. 380? Yeah. I, I like the number on that. I don't mind double double for tra- for Trace. Yeah, he's um obviously because of the number of minutes that he is only playing that right now the market's not I mean he did, hasn't really recorded double double, but again if Draymond does in fact end up playing, I think that he will be in that starting lineup for the Warriors and I think that he has the opportunity this game. You mentioned Draymond I mean, I'm sorry, you mentioned DeAndre Ayton. I mean, he hasn't really had a lot of success rebounding the basketball against the Warriors, at least. I know yeah. recently he's been a monster, but it just, there's some fact to it that whatever reason, Ayton just doesn't match up. It's not a good matchup for him uh, I think against I this Warner Warriors team. Yeah. And he's been, yeah, he's been point. really good. Um, let me see what his number is at. It's at 10 and a half at like plus 104. He's had 13 plus rebounds in three of the last four. He had yeah. 10 rebounds against New Orleans in the last game. If you want to go for maybe an interesting option, first quarter rebounds is at three and a half. He's had at least six first quarter rebounds in three of the last four games. Yeah, it's worth definitely worth a look. I mean, like you mentioned, right? He's had four straight games of double digit rebounds and three out of the last four, 13 plus. He had 22 against the Charlotte Hornets. So he had 13 against the Wizards, 18 against the Boston Celtics. And I think what Jabari Walker is that even if this game does turn into a blowout, like he's still going to be out there on the floor because just the Blazers don't have the available guys to play. So and he's young. He's, he's yeah, from. exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great call. I think I'm going to be on that one for Jabari Walker. Anything else you got for this game? Uh, no. Not really. All right, last game of the night. We've got the game of the night with uh, playoff implications. We got the New Orleans Pelicans. They are in Sacramento to take on the Kings. Kings currently laying one point here with a total of 216 and a half. Looking at the injury report for both of these teams for the Pelicans, pretty simple. Brandon Ingram continues to be out. Uh, Najee Marshall is questionable. For the Sacramento Kings, we know that Kevin Herter and Malik Monk are out. Keegan Murray is actually questionable in this game, and uh, Jordan Ford is also questionable as well. Take a look at the standings right now. The Pelicans are holding on for dear life for that sixth spot right now. They're half a game above the Phoenix Suns. The Sacramento Kings are half a game above the LA Lakers for the eighth spot. They have a tiebreaker. Yeah. Um, So for at least the Sacramento Kings, it's I think their ceiling is that eight seed because they are trailing the Phoenix Suns by a game and a half. So they could end up anywhere from eight, nine or ten can the Sacramento Kings. So uh, but they're laying a point right now against the Pelicans here. Scott, what do you think? I'm taking New Orleans. I'm not really going to hesitate on this one. New Orleans was not in good form last week, but we know this is a streaky team and they were able to uh, beat the Suns by eight. Good win there after losing to the Suns at home about a week prior. And they beat Portland. They didn't look good in that game, but they were able to come back from a halftime deficit, one by 10. Sacramento was really bad against the Knicks. They were getting killed by Boston, and they had the miracle run before losing at the end anyway. Killed the Nets, as far as I'm concerned. That doesn't count because the Nets are awful at basketball. And they should have potentially beaten the Thunder, and they fell apart again in the fourth quarter. So the Kings are not in good form. And the main reason why New Orleans has owned this team this season and uh, in previous years. So New Orleans has won. Uh, They've won seven of the last nine. 
They've won all four meetings this season. This will be the fifth meeting if they faced off in the in-season tournament. And the Pelicans have won each of those games by at least five points. I think that the Kings are just not equipped to handle the size that the Pelicans have. Zion's a freight train. Nobody can guard him on the Sacramento team. Either you use Valanchunas or you end up using Larry Nance. The point is you have options at the center position, and the Kings really don't have that. And I think defensively, this team can make life difficult for Fox. And now Monk's out. So they don't really have many shot creators on the team. You mentioned that Keegan Murray might not play, which is a big deal. Who's left? Like, you're relying on Harrison Barnes to give you a 20-plus point game to to keep this extremely competitive. The Pelicans own this team. Just simply put, I got to keep going with the Pelicans. They have dominated Sacramento time and time again in the regular season this year. I got to go Pelicans here. I think the wrong team's favorite. Yeah, I think that this is a a bad matchup for the Kings. Um, Again, I've talked a lot about how much defensive link that this Pelicans team has. I know they haven't been playing really good defense over the last five games, at least whether they're, what, bottom eight or nine. Um, But I think, again, this is going to be one of those games where, again, it's going to be playoff intensity, something similar to what we saw last night against the Denver Nuggets and Minnesota. Obviously, that was for bigger stakes for number one seed and the division. But again, you also always want to avoid having to play that extra game or two in that play-in tournament bracket, especially for a team like the Pelicans, who are without Brandon Ingram and Zion at any time can, again, unfortunately, just the way that his career has gone, I mean, he can go down and he can miss time. So I think that, again, this is all an effort for this Pelicans team. And I think you're right. I think the wrong team is favored right now. So I like the Pelicans in the spot as well. I really do. Uh, Sacramento, I think you hit the nail on the head, is that without Malik Monk coming off of the bench, if Keegan Murray doesn't play in this game, I mean, those are two guys that are that provide that scoring punch next to De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis. And again, for this Pelicans team, like they have the defensive guys in the front court that can really give Sabonis a hard time. I don't think it's going to be Valanchunas, but you know, you talk about Larry Nance, you talk about Trey Murphy, Herb Jones. They have different guys that can throw at him. And you can say the same thing that they can throw at guys like De'Aaron Fox. So I'd say all that to be on the Pelican side here. I do also like the under in this game at what 216 and a half, as I mentioned for this game, Scott. So Pelicans for me and under. You have any thoughts on the total? I'm going to have to lean over uh, just based on the head to head meetings. Yes, both teams are injured because Ingram is still out for New Orleans and Monk is still out for Sacramento. But all four meetings this season have had it at least 229. Uh, sorry, okay. 226. I, actually, I got to do the math here. Uh, 222. So, yeah, every meeting has gotten into the 220s minimum. So I'll back mm-hmm. the head-to-head history there. I'll lean to the over. Fair enough. Uh, anything on the player prop side? I mean, Zion points I was tempted by, but it's at 26 and a half. Historically, has not done an insane amount against Sacramento, but a big reason for that is that Ingram's played. So there's been less shot attempts and less overall possession and touches for him on the court. So I think that Zion can go for 30 in this game. I don't know who's going to stop him. Just simply put, I, I have no idea who on Sacramento is going to even try to stop him. Good luck. Uh, I think Zion over in points is worth serious consideration. Yeah, I think so, too. I think that, again, Zion, we know like he's kind of embraced that. Not embraced, but they've been using him in, in that kind of uh, point guard role uh, along with CJ. So we know the usage rate is going to be there for a guy like Zion and for CJ McCollum as well. There was a, a, a stat graphic I saw on Twitter that shows the difference between the number of drives that Zion has per game compared to like the rest of the field. And it's like a substantial difference about the way that Zion's number one, been able to get to the basket, finish around the basket, but also more importantly, we talked about health for Zion that, you know, something like similar, like John Moran, who's always attacking the basket, that there's always that risk for injury. And I think for this season, Zion's been really healthy uh, for the Pelicans knock on wood. So, yeah, I think that this is a good spot here for Zion. I think that if you want to look at his uh, points and rebounds to go over, but I can definitely get behind the points here for uh, uh, sorry for Zion against the Sacramento Kings here. Anything else for this game? Uh, no. I think we basically covered it. You? You have anything else you want to add? No, I think that that's pretty much it. I'm definitely going to be uh, watching this game for sure here tonight. It's going to be the uh, one game, at least on the board, uh, that's going to be the more exciting one. Um, for the schedule here tonight on Thursday. Sorry, that's going to be the last game 
for the Thursday schedule. Scott, let's get into our lock and dog here for tonight, and then we'll do our underdog fantasy entry. You want to lead us off? Sure. Uh, so for the lock on the show, I think I am going to go back to a player prop I mentioned before. I am going to go with Van Vliet over 17 and a half points. I see it at minus 106. I just think the line's too short. We know Utah is a terrible defensive team. Jalen Green has cooled off recently, and Van Vliet's kind of thrived. Van Vliet's had at least 24 points in back-to-back games. He had 37 against Orlando last time out against Utah in the three meetings this season. He has had at least 18 points in all three meetings, so I think 17 and a half is too low of a point total. Give me the over for Van Vliet points as my lock. For my dog, I was thinking about doing an alt spread, but I think instead of that, I am going to do something a bit more creative. I think I'm going to go with a two-pick parlay in this one. I am going to go with the Knicks money line parlayed with the Pelicans money line, and that pays out at plus 235. Knicks money line and Pelicans money line. Is yep. that what you said? Plus 235. All right. Love it. Uh, all right. For my lock, I am going to go with the New York Knicks here tonight. Uh, I think this is just a good spot for them. Like we mentioned, we don't know who's playing for Boston here tonight. It's just a question of motivation, right? And and or the conversation is motivation. Celtics, nothing to play for. It's just get our guys healthy, make sure they Everyone's stay healthy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Everybody for Boston's questionable. Yeah, All exactly. Yeah. So, and then for Knicks, right? You want to, you're in that fight for the, the number three seed in the Eastern Conference. I think this is a team that wants to play their best basketball going into the playoffs. You got OG and an OB back. That's only a huge boost. Jalen Brunson, like we mentioned, is playing out of his mind right now, just on a whole nother planet compared to everybody else in the league, at least recently. So I think there's a good spot here for the Knicks. So I'm going to take the Knicks here. I think they uh, could possibly win by double digits here. So the Knicks for me, minus the two and a half. Um, I hate to be boring, but again, it's it's Pelicans on the alt line for winning me. Winning is winning. So it's yeah. Fun. Yeah. And we're cashing the same tickets here. So Pelicans, I'll take this up to minus three and a half. That's at plus 130. I know we have a rule of 140, so I'll just take it up to minus four for the Pelicans at plus 140 uh, in this game. I, again, I just think that they're a a really good matchup for the Kings, meaning like defensively, I think they can give them really big problems. And you mentioned, right, the numbers that this is going to be the fifth meeting between these two teams, including the in-season tournament. Kings 0-4 straight up, 0-4 against the spread against this Pelicans team. The under is three and one, but again, that number is a little bit adjusted, especially with all the injuries for, uh, you know, the Pelicans with Brandon Ingram. And then obviously with, we talked about with the Kings, with Malik Monk and possibly Keegan Murray not playing here tonight. But saying all that, Pelicans minus the four, alt spread plus 140. I mean, if you want to get a little bit creative, maybe take like Zion uh, points prop plus the Pelicans money line. Uh, a bit of a correlation there that Zion has to have a pretty good game here tonight for the Pelicans to win, but officially as my dog minus four on the alt spread plus plus one forty. that's currently over on DraftKings for the Pelicans. All right, Scott, let's, uh, let's try to get out a winner here, man. Uh, I know you and I have done really good on our underdog fantasy entry. So we'll put one together here for the final Thursday of the regular season, at least. Um, so again, underdog fantasy.com. Make sure you guys use that promo code NBA SGP. And this is a great time. To get in before the playoffs start, it's going to be a lot of fun uh, putting those entries together as well. So definitely uh, come join us. Make sure you use our promo code NBA SGP and first deposit. Uh, you'll get a hundred percent bonus up to one hundred dollars from Underdog Fantasy for opening a new account. All right, let me go over to the NBA side here. Uh, pre-game let's do that and then let me click on nba and that will get me everything all right uh where do we want to go here scott uh, i'm trying to think of well i like van vliet so if you want okay. to start with the points we can start there let's start van vliet he is at 17 and a half we'll go higher on that do you like his points higher better or do you like his threes better honestly i'm not gonna overthink it i'll just take the points he's going right. to the okay. line more the attempts will be there it's it's fine you talk can't guard anybody fair enough where are we going next? Uh, you want to go Brunson? 
Uh, sure. I mean, thirty His and points, a half. I think are like thirty and a half. I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm still uh, not against it. You had thirty four last game. Yeah, I'm not gonna Boston. double. I'm not gonna double think it. He he's just okay. playing out of his mind right now. And then let's throw in one more entry here. Let's, uh, get you bold. Go... let's, let's go with Jabari Walker rebounds. So that's oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I like that. That's a good call. Jabari Walker's rebounds are at 10.5 over on Underdog. We'll go higher on that. All right, pretty simple. We'll go Fred Van Vliet, higher 17.5 points. Jalen Brunson, higher 30.5 points. And Jabari Walker, higher 10.5 rebounds tonight against the Warriors. That $10 entry will get you a return of 60 Dollars again. Make sure you guys head over to underdogfantasy.com if you don't have an account already. Um, come join us. Make sure you use that promo code NBA SGPN. You'll get a first deposit bonus of up to one hundred dollars, hundred percent up to one hundred dollars. And if you already have an account, get your friends involved, family members, coworkers, anybody of eighteen years or older, and in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. And uh, let's yeah, let's make some uh, money here with Underdog Fantasy as well. That's going to wrap it up for this edition of the NBA Gambling Podcast. Last Thursday of the regular season, uh, we have the Friday games left. I think everybody is off on Saturday, and then on Sunday, every team plays before we get into the play-in tournament uh, bracket next week. Scott, anything else you want to mention before we get out of here? Uh, No, not really. I'll back once again tomorrow to go through the Friday games with Terrell. Uh, NBA season, regular season, almost over. So make sure you savor it and make sure you make the most of the last couple games. Because think about it. Over the weekend on Sunday, which I think is the official last day of the season, yep. the last time you can watch the Pistons play basketball, you got to savor these opportunities. Yeah, I was going to say you're going you're gonna to mention like another team like the no. Nets or something. But yeah, the no. Pistons have been bad. Or you could have said this might be the last time you get to watch uh, Victor in his... Uh, Wimby in his last game of uh, his rookie season, at least. But Could who be. knows? I was kind of going for the, for the point is trying to capitalize on bad teams because <laughs> on Sunday, they're all just gone. So yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah, and then we'll be down to uh, business with the, the big boys left for the playoffs and the play in the tournament. All right, like Scott mentioned, Terrell and Scott back tomorrow, usual time, same place, same time. Uh, same time. Come join us then. Uh, make sure you follow Scott on Twitter. That's at Right Show Radio. You can follow me there as well at Sports Nerd824. More importantly, make sure you guys subscribe to the NBA Gambling Podcast YouTube channel. And do us a favor, you know, leave us a comment uh, in the video there as well. Maybe leave your picks as well. I uh, kind of want to see what our listeners are betting on as well. I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Till then, good luck with your bets. Let's break these books off and let it ride.